Okay. Proverbs. I, I call this a short study of Proverbs because I'm not going to go through every one of the Proverbs. That would take us quite a while. But I want to focus a lot on the first nine, and then I'll do some select Proverbs. And uh, I think you'll have plenty of Proverbs by the time we're finished. This morning, I want to introduce the book. And I want to tell you, well, by the way, now that we have some more people in here, I'm going to ha I actually have a handout of the outline. And I see John. I'm putting John right to work. You can throw some of these around here. I'm sure I have too many of these, but I'm going to ask you. I'm going to grab you. If you would pass out, just scatter those around. What I want to do is introduce Proverbs this morning. And first talk about the title of Proverbs. Well, the book of Proverbs, it's really a collection of collections of Hebrew poetry that falls within the broad category that's denoted by the Hebrew word mashal, which is the first word in the book. It, it falls within that broad category. It includes not only the, the short, pithy statements of popular wisdom that we typically associate with Proverbs. When you say Proverbs, you have an idea of these, you know, crisp, short, pithy statements. That's what we typically associate with Proverbs. It not only includes that, but this Hebrew word mashal includes also the kinds of things that we would consider parables and even some extended instructional discourses. So it's broader than what we typically think of with just the classic proverb. But that's what, it's a collection of collections of poetry that's within that broad category that falls within this Hebrew word mashal. A.S. Herbert, some decades ago, he wrote in the Scottish Journal of Theology, he said, Proverb Mashal had a clearly recognizable purpose, that of quickening an apprehension of the real as distinct from the wished for. You see, what, what I, how I want it to be, you see, bringing you to what is really going on, uh, the real as distinct from the wished for of compelling the hearer or reader to form a judgment on himself, his situation, or his conduct. This idea of really convicting and bringing me to see reality and to see my circumstance clearly. He ends, this usage comes to its finest expression in the parables of Jesus. And we finished uh, st uh, studying the parables uh, just last week. Now, rhyme and rhythm, as you probably know, they're not significant in Hebrew, Hebrew poetry. In English poetry... It's all about rhyme and rhythm. That's, how we ha that's what marks English poetry. But if, it, if Hebrew poetry were about rhyme and rhythm, it would be lost anyway in translation. Because we're not reading Hebrew. We're reading an English translation of Hebrew. But Hebrew poetry is not that way anyway. Its major characteristics are terseness, conciseness, you see, parallelism which you have one line that is then a thought there that's related to a thought in the following line or lines. So you have terseness, parallelism, and as is true, I think, of all poetry, you have an intensive use of imagery. All right. Everybody get one of these. It's an outline I'm going to be talking about a little bit later. If not, oh well. <laughs> but we have, so I, I think these things, the characteristic Hebrew poetry, ter terseness, parallelism and this intensive use of imagery. All right, we got spares. Now the English title, Book of Proverbs, that comes to us, somebody else needs some? That comes to us by way of the Latin Vulgate. Vulgate is the, is the Latin translation that was done by Jerome, and it's Liber Proverbiorum in Latin, so we just bring it over into English as Book of Proverbs. You think you get one? Yeah, Come on, Matt. <laughs> so, I, so that's, that's, that's where we get the title of, of Proverbs from. Now, the book of Proverbs, it's divine instruction for skillful living in God's world. That's how I think you ought to think of it. In, divine instruction for skillful living. It reveals principles for navigating life, guidance, 
for the conduct of one's affairs, which lead to blessing, See, which lead to a good life. So it's these principles, this guidance for how to conduct oneself in God's world, skillful living in God's world. In this day, you know, we have people today who are actually making a living as life coaches. So I'm thinking as life coaches in a world that, that's into life coaches, certainly Proverbs ought to resonate because that's what Proverbs is about. It's about training us up, making us wise for life how to live skillfully in this world. In Robert Alden's words, he's an Old Testament scholar, he says, the purpose of Proverbs is to make us less often foolish and more often wise or to improve our overall performance in life. How to live so as to be blessed in this world. How to live a good life. Now God has made this wisdom, this guidance for living a good life, He's made this available in a number of avenues that are recognized in the book of Proverbs. So there are different ways one can gain this insight or this knowledge for skillful living. And he recognizes those different ways in the book of Proverbs. One of them is observation and experience. And you can see that acknowledged in in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. You can gain it by instruction from others. And you can see that acknowledged in Proverbs 4, 1 to 4, 22, 17 and 18. You can gain it from discipline and correction. You can see that, for example, in Proverbs 10, 17 and 12, 1. So there are different ways one can gain this wisdom. One can gain this guidance for wise or skillful living in this world. But in Proverbs, God has provided a concentrated revelation of this wisdom in this book. So so there are other ways of getting it. He acknowledges that in Proverbs. But here you get this concentrated revelation of wisdom, this skill for living in God's world. Concentrated here in the book of Proverbs. But one, to really gain this, one must fear him. You see, one must fear God. One must recognize his awesomeness and must recognize that he's the center of all things to absorb rightly the wisdom that God has made available. You see, you won't take it in. You won't use it correctly. To absorb it and to benefit from it, the starting point is one must fear God. One must have that perspective and understand who God is. That then sets your spirit in a way that you then can be formed and receive the teaching and then benefit from it so that you live skillfully in God's world. That's why you see in Proverbs 1.7, right here at the beginning, this preamble, it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You see, they they think they know, they're going to judge and and sit here and evaluate God and say, no, 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 no. Fearing God and understanding who God is, that's the person who's then in the benefit, in the position to benefit. Now, Proverbs, they were common throughout the ancient Near East. They were common there. And some Proverbs from other cultures are very similar to, to the Proverbs that we see in the book of Proverbs, and they predate them. You see, for example, Proverbs in Egypt. They are very similar to what we see in the book of Proverbs, and they are earlier than the book of Proverbs. And this has caused some consternation among Bible believers because they see this lack of uniqueness as evidence against the Bible's inspiration. But that's misguided. Okay, those two things don't really connect. The fact pagans have, through observation and experience, perceived principles at work in God's world doesn't mean that God cannot inspire writers to reveal those principles to his people. You see, the fact this world is arranged so that people can, in fact, perceive principles in God's world does not mean that God cannot inspire people to give those principles to his people. Divine inspiration 
it's a guarantee that what is affirmed is true. It's not a guarantee that what is affirmed is unique and heretofore unknown. You see, those are, those are different, different questions. Moreover, the true wisdom is more than simply perceiving the principles that are at work in God's world. It involves more than that. It includes and depends on a proper recognition of the one true God. So though these things were observed in other cultures and seen, and perhaps even put in pithy statements, they are losing something and missing something because they deny and do not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's why you get this. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Tremper Longman, in his book on Proverbs, he comments, he says, Pagans may well stumble, stumble on some interesting and helpful truth that provides insight on how to avoid a problem or achieve a desired goal. They may even be able to formulate that bit of advice in a way that is memorable. The Israelite sages may even adapt the advice for inclusion in the book of Proverbs. However, based on 1.7, they still would not judge pagan, pagan wisdom teachers as truly and authentically wise because they lack fear of Yahweh. So I want you to see, sometimes you'll run across and you'll see Proverbs and you'll say, well, there were, you know, the Egyptians had Proverbs over here. And I want you to see how to understand that. Nobody thinks Proverbs recognizes that this world is arranged so that by observation and experience, you can discern principles for skillful living. You can do that. But here we get God by inspiration providing a concentrated dose of this to people who fear the Lord and therefore in a, are in a position to truly benefit and absorb this wisdom. So that's something I just wanted to mention to you. Now, about the authorship of it, the opening verse says, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Now, that fits well with what we're told about Solomon in 1 Kings. He pursued and he received wisdom. You see that in 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 1 to 15. And he was internationally famous for his wisdom. I mean, this guy was known as being somebody who was special in wisdom. You see that in 1 Kings chapter 4 and in chapter 10. We're told in 1 Kings chapter 4 verse 32 that he uttered or he spoke 3,000 proverbs. He uttered or spoke 3,000 proverbs and his songs numbered 1,005. So this fits, this idea of, of Solomon and the book of Proverbs certainly fits. But whatever his connection is to the book of Proverbs, it's clear from the text of Proverbs itself that he was not the author or the source of everything in the collection. Okay, he's not the author or the source of everything. That's clear from the text of Proverbs itself. Proverbs twenty-two seventeen and 24, 23. They indicate that the Proverbs in chapter 22, verse 17, through 24, verse 34, that they were from a group called simply the wise. That's who, that's who provided those Proverbs. Proverbs 30, verses 1 to 33. They're sayings of an unknown man named Agur that you see. Just, you're just told that. In Proverbs 31, 1 to 9, there are sayings of an unknown king named Lemuel, where he passes on or repeats what his mother had taught him. And it seems unlikely, in fact, that Solomon is the author or the source of the first nine chapters of Proverbs. That seems unlikely because Proverbs chapter 10, verse 1, is titled, The Proverbs of Solomon. Okay, chapter 10, verse 1 is titled The Proverbs of Solomon. Now, if the first nine chapters, if they were Proverbs of Solomon, then one would expect chapter 10, verse 1 to be worded like chapter 25, verse 1, which says these also are the Proverbs of Solomon. That's how it's done in 25, 1, where you've got Proverbs of Solomon, then we come over and we say, these also are the Proverbs of Solomon. Well, if 1 through 9 are the Proverbs of Solomon, then I would expect 10, 1 to be like that and say, these also are the Proverbs of Solomon. 
but it doesn't say that. So that suggests to me that Solomon is not the author or source of chapters 1 through 9. But 10.1, you have these are the Proverbs of Solomon. So, on the, so on the, he's not the author of everything in the collection or the source of it. But on the other hand, Solomon is stated explicitly to be the author or the source of the Proverbs in chapter 10, verse 1, through chapter 22, verse 16. That's a big chunk. From 10.1 to 22.16, and he's specifically said to be the author or source of Proverbs 25, 1 through 29, 27. Another big chunk. Okay, so he's not the author or source of everything, but he's the author or source of plenty. He's clearly the dominant contributor to this collection of Proverbs. And that coupled with the fact that he was, he was the greatest of Israel's wisdom teachers, that may explain why the entire collection of Proverbs is associated with him. It's essentially a collection of Proverbs that the great Solomon had produced. It's essentially his collection that has been introduced by the first nine chapters and then supplemented by others all in conformity with the wisdom of Solomon. That's how I look at it. So even the supplementation, the introduction and these other supplements to this large collection of Solomon's Proverbs, even that is fruit of Solomon's root. Okay, it's coming out of Solomon. It's in the manner of Solomon. So I think that's what's going on. Now as far as the date, well, when, is, when does Proverbs date? Well, Proverbs, it's a, it's a collection of material from sources that appears to have been put together over a significant length of time. Now, again, this sometimes bothers people. I say, why? Why does it bother you? Do you not think God can superintend a process by which he brings to completion precisely what he wanted? Sure he can. As you say, like in Luke chapter 1, what's Luke doing? Luke's what? He's consulting sources. Uh-oh. I thought Luke had to sit in a trance and write. No. Inspiration's more sophisticated than that. God's superintendent of this process is greater than that. So you have Proverbs, it's brought into being, it appears over a significant period of time. You can see this in the fact that the second group of Solomon's Proverbs in 25, 1 through 29, 27, they were copied by men associated with King Hezekiah. Now Solomon died in 931 or 930 B.C., and King Hezekiah, he reigned in Judah from 715 to 687 B.C. So apparently this collection of Proverbs was still in process more than two centuries after Solomon's death. So it's, it's something that, that it was something that was brought together and collected over a, a lengthy period of time and when this collection reached its final form, its canonical form, the way you and I have it as Scripture, when it reached that final form is impossible to say. We know that the book of Proverbs was considered authoritative Scripture by at least the 2nd century B.C., but we don't, know long, we don't know how long before that its form was finalized or the steps in the process of finalizing its form where you have these different collections being assembled and put together and perhaps edited under inspiration, of course. You see, so that all of this is the production of what? Canonical Proverbs that God wanted. But we don't have all the details of that, you see. But as Tremper Longman points out, he says, that's of no major importance. What is of interest is the final product and how the Proverbs function in their present context you see that's what's important so you and I look at the canonical book of Proverbs and that's what we want to know is how does this function here what is the meaning what are we to glean from this what is the message of God to us as we read the book of Proverbs now the structure is this outline that has been passed out that I adapted from Longman's commentary and you can see that there and I just of course it was on my website the outlet.us but I don't think anybody looks at that, so I, I, put it, I, I gave it to you, so you'll have it there. You can look at it. And you see there's a fundamental division in the book of Proverbs between chapters 1 and 9, 
and chapters 10 through 31. There's this fundamental division. Now the first section, chapters 1 to 9, it consists almost entirely of speeches or extended discourses mainly from a father to his son, but in some cases a speaker a speaker's a woman, a woman named Wisdom, who addresses the crowd of naive young men who walk by her. You see that in chapter 1, verse 20 to 33. And in chapter 8, verse 1 through chapter 9, verse 6. And then at the end of this section, chapters 1 to 9, at the end of this section, another woman appears. A woman named Folly. And her words are reported. And I think there's something to Tremper Longman's claim. Longman's an Old Testament scholar. He's written uh, commentaries on many books, including Proverbs. I think there's something to his claim that these competing appeals you get at the end of this introductory nine chapters, this, these competing appeals you get from woman wisdom and woman folly to become intimately associated with them, to make them an integral part of our lives, it's a call to readers to decide how they're going to handle and deal with the following material. Will they embrace God's way as they get ready to read and study these Proverbs that are coming up in 10 through 31? Will they embrace His way or will they turn a deaf ear to His way and choose to embrace woman folly? You see, it's, almost, it's like it's putting them to this choice. Make a decision as you launch into these classical proverbs how you're going to take them. You see, and, and woman folly may well represent the false gods that competed for Israel's allegiance. You see, it's like these two voices, these two paths, these two ways. You have woman wisdom and woman folly. Are you going to embrace wisdom and then go ahead and make that decision how you're going to receive what's coming up? Or are you going to turn a deaf ear to it and embrace woman folly? And I think that's what's, what's happening there. Now the classical Proverbs, chapters 10 through 31, they, those chapters contain what we typically think of as Proverbs, these brief pointed statements that you know, nicely express ideas that are, are uh, ideas that are commonly accepted as true. They state an insight or they, they make an observation or they offer advice in the form of admonition or prohibition. Now it's important, I want to spend a little bit of time saying that, that proverbs like this, it's inherent in the literary form. Proverbs like this, they do not teach absolute truths. Well, what do I mean by that? You see, rather, they're statements of general principles, see, to which there can be exceptions, and they apply only in certain circumstances. So they are general, they are general principles, and they are circumstantially limited. Let me give you some examples of this. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent make rich. Well, that's generally true. You see, that's generally true, but certainly there are cases where lazy bums have stumbled into an awful lot of money. You see, whether they've inherited it or whatever, and there are cases where diligent workers have been left in poverty. I mean, there are cases like that, right? That doesn't mean the proverb is wrong. The proverb is untrue. It means the proverb is a general rather than an absolute truth. And that's the nature of proverbs. And it's a mistake not to understand that. When Proverbs 12, 21 says, No ill befalls the righteous, but the wicked are filled with trouble. Okay, it's not intended as an ironclad pronouncement to which there can be no exceptions. The point of the proverb is that righteous living produces fewer problems than wicked living. It could easily be an abuse of this scripture, see, to cite it to this text to somebody who's experiencing much hardship, to cite it to them as proof that they're wicked. You see how that, how that could be? 
And as I'll point about, that's like a thorn bush in the hand of a drunkard. You see, somebody who would take this proverb and apply it automatically as though it's some ironclad pronouncement. Famously, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Well, it's generally true that a child who's trained in godly ways will continue to walk in that path. But that proverb's not intended as an absolute promise or guarantee that no child trained in God's wisdom will ever abandon that path. That is not how proverbs function. Longman says, parents are here encouraged to train their children in God's way since that will lead to their godliness, all other things being equal. It is much more likely that children will go the right way if so trained than if their spiritual education is ignored. But all things might not be equal. Perhaps the children fall in with a bad crowd who persuade them to go a different direction. Or there may be a host of other reasons for why a child rejects God's way. A single proverb does not intend to address all the nuances of a situation. It just gives a snapshot of life to motivate proper behavior. And I think it's important to understand this. The fact God chose to speak these truths in the literary form of Proverbs means he intends for them to be understood as Proverbs. And this is part of understanding Proverbs. They are by nature general. You see, there are general statements of truth to which there can be exceptions. You know, just thinking about the one that I put up there before about no ill befalls the righteous. Well, what about Job? Do you think that's trying to say that, you know, no, no. Uh, the proverb's false. There's a conflict. Or do you think it means generally, and of course there can be exceptions like people like Job. Well, it's the same thing here. You see this idea of train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he'll not depart from it. It is a general truth. It's important. It's significant. But it's not an ironclad statement, some kind of legal principle. Now, for any who might be tempted to overinterpret Proverbs as establishing an ironclad link between godly behavior and earthly blessings, as teaching that good people experience only good things and that bad people experience only bad things in life, well, the correction to that are the wisdom books of Job and Ecclesiastes. They show that's not the case, don't they? I mean, isn't, that, isn't Job a righteous man? And yet God is doing something else in his life and having him suffer greatly. And yet he's righteous. So we see the principle that, yes, there are times and occasions in the wisdom and action of God when the righteous suffer. Okay, so you, this is something that's important. And you see in Ecclesiastes where Kohelet speaks repeatedly of the observational disconnect between behavior and circumstances. He's looking around under the sun. He's observing life here as he sees it. And he sees all kinds of things that don't go along with this idea that the righteous only get good things and the, and the wicked only get bad things. You see, he sees plenty of these things. The race doesn't always go to the swift. And on and on and on. He's observing life. You've observed life. You can't deny that. And Proverbs doesn't intend to deny it. You see, but it's an important corrective on how we might read these things sometimes. That's why Longman says that Proverbs, uh, that, that Job and Ecclesiastes beg to be read in conjunction with Proverbs. You see, that this is this balance idea. People can go off and picking slices of things and riding hobby horses and distorting things. That's why, you know, there has to be a broader view on these kinds of things. It's, that's important. Now, I said that Proverbs are general. I've given you some examples of that. I also said that Proverbs are circumstantially limited. And you get a beautiful example of, the, example of this. He, uh, this is long when talking about uh, Job and Ecclesiastes where he says, those books quash any presumption that one invariably and immediately receives rewards for good behavior and punishments for bad behavior. Proverbs 26, 4 and 5, they're circumstantially limited. Look what you get here. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. 
Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Oh, I guess the guy here, he just had an aneurysm or something. He didn't know what he's writing. Writing the very opposite thing. This is how people deal with this sometimes. Oh, you see the contradiction. I'm saying, do you think the guy writing this is that stupid? You, you know, you, you think he doesn't recognize that these things, just puts it out there and says, oh, well, I didn't know that. Uh -huh. Do you think that? You see, no, that's not, that's not the case at all. You see, these things are sick. They're, they're circumstantially limited. There are times and circumstances when it's wise to ignore a fool, and there are times and circumstances when it is wise to engage a fool. Part of wisdom is being able to tell the difference. It's being able to discern which is the right uh, note to sound. Longman says, the wise person must assess whether this is a fool who will simply drain one's energy with no positive results or whether an answer will prove fruitful to the fool or perhaps to those who overhear. This reminds me of people commenting on, uh, you know, internet things. Okay, I generally stay away from all that because... I'm in the first category. I think it's pointless. But there may be times, and I've had people ask me about this, and they say, well, I think I want to talk to the people who are over here. And I say, oh, yeah, I have at it. You see? But you see this idea. Wise person must assess whether it's a, a fool who will simply drain one's energy with no positive results or whether an answer will prove fruitful to the fool or perhaps to those who over here. The wise not only know the proverb, but also can read the circumstances and the people with whom they dialogue. You see, this is something that's, that's important. It's important to recognize. I mean, this same phenomenon is present, is present in modern Proverbs. This isn't unique to biblical Proverbs. I mean, we say too many cooks spoil the broth. Right? Too many cooks spoil the broth. We also say many hands make light work. Well, which is it? Is it too many cooks spoil the broth, or is it many hands make light work? Well, it's both, <laughs> depending on the circumstances. Additional workers interfere with the accomplishment of some task, and they aid in the accomplishment of others. Part of wisdom is recognizing the time and circumstances to which a proverb applies. It's part of, that's part of wisdom, is recognizing that. And when proverbs are applied in inappropriate circumstances, like if you took somebody suffering and you said, no ill befalls the righteous, you're a wicked person, that very well may be applying that proverb in the wrong circumstance. When proverbs are applied improperly in the wrong circumstance, they are useless and can even be dangerous. Now here we have, look at this, Proverbs 26.7. Like, lame, like a lame man's legs, which hang useless, is a proverb in the mouth of fools. Well, what's that about? That's because a fool doesn't know when the proverb applies, so the proverb lacks any power. He's just out throwing them out. See, the proverb has to be in the right circumstance, the right situation. Then it's a word in season. You see, well, this guy, so it's useless if he doesn't know the circumstance in which it properly applies. But more than that, in 26.9, says, says, like a thorn that goes up into the hand of a drunkard is a proverb in the mouth of fools. It can be dangerous or harmful, right? You got this drunk dude with his thorns. He doesn't know. He's just grabbing it. What's he care? So it's, it's this idea of, of knowing the situation and the circumstance and having a feel for that. Now some Proverbs, I have to say, do seem to express universal truths. There are some like that. For example, Proverbs 11.1 1 says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. Well, what are you talking about there? You're talking about balances where I'm using them to cheat you. In other words, if you're coming to me to buy a pound of stuff and I got the scale rigged, so I'm really giving you three quarters of a pound and you're paying for a pound, I'm just cheating you. Okay, well the Lord delights in what? Just scales, meaning you're not cheating the person. Okay, that doesn't seem to be something to which there are any exceptions. As Longman says, he says, if there are exceptions to this proverb, they're so rare as to be unimportant. So there are some like that, but that's generally not the nature of proverbs and you have to recognize that. 
Let me say a little bit about woman wisdom. There's much debate about the, the particulars of this figure, woman wisdom, in the book of Proverbs. Now, rather than examine the debate and go in all the different perspectives and things like that, I'm just going to give you my take on it, my understanding, my opinion about who woman wisdom is and how you should understand woman wisdom. I think woman wisdom personifies or represents God's wisdom as it includes aspects of God's wisdom that have been purposed for human perception and discovery. You know, there are things about God's wisdom that are inaccessible to us. Does that shock anybody? That there are mysteries of God, there are things of God's wisdom that are too deep and beyond us and that are inaccessible to us. But there is wisdom from God that is a subset of God's wisdom that he has made accessible to human beings. So I think woman wisdom is a personification of God's wisdom as he has made that distinction between wisdom that is accessible to mankind and the wisdom that is hidden in him. In other words, it represents God's wisdom in which that subset has been distinguished, a subset that God determined prior to creation would be accessible to mankind. And as the, as the personification of God's wisdom, both in its communicable, what is accessible to mankind, and its non-communicable aspects, that which is secret and beyond human access and perception, in both of those aspects, you see, it's that the time of that distinction, I think. So it represents God's wisdom as distinguished into communicable and non-communicable. And I think that distinction is represented poetically as the time of wisdom being begotten or born. The time when that wisdom is distinguished that is available to mankind from this larger universe of God's wisdom. So it is a personification of God's wisdom, but not simply God's wisdom. God's wisdom is distinguished into that which is accessible to man and that which is not. And that distinction of that which is accessible and that which is not, I think, is poetically expressed in the birth of wisdom. Because wisdom has always been with God. There's no time when there's no wisdom. So I think the expression of the birth of wisdom is a poetic reflection of this distinguishing. Okay, that, that's... I hope that, that says something to you. Now, as the personification of God's wisdom, woman wisdom was present when God created the heavens and the earth and was involved in that process. That's what you see in Proverbs 8, 22 through 31. And as Longman points out, the obvious point of that picture of woman wisdom is that if one wants to know how the world works and therefore how to navigate life with its problems and pitfalls, then wisdom is the one to get to know. Wisdom was there at creation, right? So if you're going to want to know how do I skillfully live in God's creation, well, wisdom was there. So getting to know wisdom is going to be a good way to know how to artfully and skillfully navigate life for blessing. So I think that's what this is about. If one wants to know how the world works and therefore how to navigate life with its problems and pitfalls, then wisdom is the one to get to know. Who would know better how to act in the world than the one through whom it was made? Now this is poetry, right? You're seeing all you, you can't ever forget that, this idea that this is poetry and it's done that way. Now woman wisdom's relationship to Christ, I hope I can get this out before the bell rings, this has a long and turbulent interpretive history. From at least the middle of the second century, Christians equated woman wisdom with Jesus Christ. And then in the early fourth century, a man named Arius and his followers, they seized upon that equating of Jesus with woman wisdom, that identification, leaning heavily on Proverbs chapter 8, 22, to argue that Jesus was a created being. You see, so that's the, the, they seized on that. Now, that position that Jesus is not, in fact, the eternal God, not the second member of the Godhead, that he is a creature, well, that was rightly recognized and denounced as heresy. 
by the Council of Nicaea in, in A.D. 325. I know we wince when you say councils, but all you have to recognize is this was a gathering of theologians in the early 4th century who said, that ain't right. <laughs> okay, they said, no, that's not right. And, but you still see this heresy. It continues. It continues in particular religious groups, Jehovah's Witnesses, and others, you see it. Now, there certainly are similarities between the portrait of woman wisdom in Proverbs and Jesus Christ, but the two are not to be equated. Jesus is the second person of the Godhead. I've talked about this many times. He's the second person of the Godhead, whereas woman wisdom is a metaphor for divine wisdom that humans are called to seek in relation to revering God. Longman says Proverbs 8 is not a prophecy of Jesus or any kind of literal description of him. We must remember that the text is poetry and is using metaphor to make important points about the nature of God's wisdom. Now, of course, Jesus is the embodiment of God's wisdom. He's the perfect example of life lived rightly. See, he's the perfect example. He's the embodiment of wisdom. You want skillful living? He's the embodiment of that, the perfect example of life lived rightly. Moreover, the choice between woman wisdom and woman folly that's presented in chapters 8 and 9, that now has to be understood in terms of Christ's having appeared. That has to be understood in terms of his having appeared. See, woman wisdom's appeal to embrace her in Proverbs, that appeal is now subsumed by Christ's call to embrace him you see here's this woman wisdom jesus is the epitome the essence of wisdom the embodiment of wisdom so her call as divine wisdom to embrace her is now subsumed in jesus call to embrace him the embodiment of divine wisdom and to de deny all competing allegiances so that's that's how i think you see the it is a metaphor for God's wisdom with this distinction being made between that which is communicable and that which is not. After, it is not to be identified with Jesus, but after Christ's coming, her appeal to embrace her is now subsumed in his appeal to embrace him. Okay, I think that's, that's how to understand it. Now, what's the rel relevance of Proverbs to the church? I know that bell's going to ring in a second. He may be holding it just while I'm running. But I'll keep talking until it rings because i got more to say. All right. What's the relevance? Uh, is, is Proverbs relevant to the church? Sometimes you're going to say, well, that's Old Testament, Old Testament. I can't tell you what little hair I have left. I pull out when I hear that. Uh, but we'll pick up, Lord willing, next week with the relevance of Proverbs to the New Testament. Then we'll get on and start with the text of it. Thank you.